Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next session, session four of the Next Economy Movement Series. Um, I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy, along with my other partner, Andrew Baskin from Lyft. And we're joined by David Jackson, interim CEO at Evolve Oakland. Some of you know it's formerly known as Impact Hub Oakland. Um, and the title of this session is Evolving from Moment to Movement. And so before we get into the content or introduce David, I'm just briefly going to do a little housekeeping and then we'll get into the more fun stuff. Um, so just for folks who are getting used to using uh, Crowdcast, you can post comments. We, we want to know where folks are calling in from um, or joining the webinar. Size uh, <laughs> size si from Evolve, I love it. Um, and uh, we'll also be uh, taking questions. So if you have comments, put them in the chat. Uh, and then if you have any questions, um, post there's a little button at the bottom and you can actually ask a question and we can track it down there. People can upvote it and downvote it. Um, we're gonna be live streaming this. So this is live stream to Facebook. If you're watching this on Facebook, you can click the link and come on over and uh, join us on Crowdcast. Uh, and this is recorded. And you can check these out either uh, after this session, you can click on the same link and watch the recording or any of the previous recordings and also uh, at the Lyft Economy uh, YouTube channel. So uh, Andrew, let me kick it to you if you wanna do an intro and overview of the session. Yeah, so um, just a, I'll do a brief introduction. Um, yeah, so we're coming to this conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, um, not as experts, our intention is to um, not really make this about us at all, but to make this about all of us. Really grateful to have David on today. And we wanna just be transparent and vulnerable that uh, we're learning in this process and might not get this thing right, right off the bat. Uh, but hopefully we can all be somewhat patient with uh, what uh, kind of facilitating an emergent process together and support carrying this conversation to a place that can really serve the moment and the movement. So, um, we gave a, a little bit of a deeper introduction in the first uh, session that we did on Crowdcast, which there's a little bar at the top. You can see the schedule. And if you go back to session one, you can, if you're so interested, watch that deeper explanation. Um, these are conversations that kind of build on themselves, uh, continuing to evolve. And we see ourselves playing kind of this organizing, convening role and how one way that we're kind of thinking about this, framing up our, even our understanding of kind of why we're doing this series is asking the question um, uh, kind of about the movement at, at many different levels of, of what's needed um, at the kind of level of economy and movements, our communities, local economies, enterprise, personally, emotionally. Um, <clears throat> so we're just kind of paying attention to that and, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm scratching my throat and uh, testing the uh, hypothesis that um, we're kind of testing the hypothesis that right now there it there's not as 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 high of a degree of like a movement of movements that we think that there could be um, you know and you know maybe we're not as communicating as well across movements as we could so seeing that maybe there's a need for some stitching together of um, yeah, some movement in infrastructure relationships. And is this a space, uh, is this series um, a space that can provide value for that? And one action that's come up in previous conversations is maybe um, maybe doing some Venn diagram, uh, like calling for sort of a shared emergent vision and maybe doing some uh, Venn diagram work of overlapping areas of our, you know, multiple of our diverse visions um, and kind of facilitate an emergent vision from those areas of overlap. But, you know, we're kind of still just, we're really curious, like, before we just get carried away and, and go down that road, re really curious, like, what are what are all of your thoughts? Um, you know, we see ourselves as learning together with all of you. And our question is, um, yeah, how can we grow and bring together a more powerful movement for the next economy? Um, and we especially, again, want to welcome folks who feel that they're maybe new to the conversation or inexperienced in this idea of the quote unquote next economy, um, that language in particular, we're all at different stages of our journey and we wanna make sure that everyone feels included and welcome. So please don't hesitate to add questions to the 
Q or post comments in the chat. And again, you can upvote and downvote those questions. So I want to just take a moment to introduce David. And so grateful again to have you on, David. Um, Oakland is, uh, Oakland has had heart and has long been a hub of racial justice and intersectional activism in the United States and rooted in Oakland. Evolve Oakland brings together many organizations together at the intersection of racial justice and social entrepreneurship. And uh, David, from his role as the head of Evolve Oakland, has had unique insight into um, movements and organizing for racial justice and social entrepreneurship. Evolve is both a curator of and host of events and many leading movement building organizations, organizations like Common Future, Sustainable Economies Law Center, Black Girls Code, Runway Project, B-Lab, et cetera, um, are either currently based at Evolve or have, or have in the past been based there. And uh, so we wanted to bring in, uh, you know, that David has insights into, um, you know, what, what works with movement building groups, who attends which events, how many people show up, what gets discussed, what happens and more. So David, I just want to bring you in. And uh, I gave a bit of an introduction there, but curious if there's uh, more that you'd like to share. Yeah, thanks, Andrew and, and Ryan for, uh, for having me. And hello to everyone uh, in Crowdcast land, Cy who's also one of our members. Hello to you also. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's important for us to be known as the, the hub, for lack of a better word, for those who are um, looking to make a difference in the world. And we, we, we love to use the word all, but, but few folks are really um, putting forth the, the effort and the sweat to to make the world a better place for all. And so a part of our intentional design of the space is making sure we have touch points in every area, whether it's uh, food inequity, whether it's uh, race inequity, whether it's around healthcare, entrepreneurship, education, youth advocacy work. Uh, we have intentionally curated a, a physical space, which is now spilling into the digital world um, as, as a home for, uh, for folks who are who are doing the work for all. And right now we have a hyper-local focus on, uh, on black folks um, to, to really do our part in bridging the disproportionate inequity amongst all sectors um, and in areas of work. So, so thank you for having me. Absolutely, yeah, so, so excited to have you on. And uh, man, I even just want to dive into <laughs> a lot of the things that you just shared. As I, I mean, maybe we can just like, uh, you know, maybe it will frame up that last part of just what you shared around the hyper-local focus. Um, like what, you, in, our, in our, some of our previous conversations leading up to this moment, we, we, you had shared this kind of framing around what does it mean to evolve from moment to movement? And you're just kind of sharing about starting at a hyper-local level and um, would love to hear more about um, some of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it starts individually. It's, I, I think we, uh, we become so uh, macro that we forget about the micro. Like the first person, the first thing um, the first something that I lead is not my organization, it's not my family, it's not my friend circle, but it's myself. And I think oftentimes when we start uh, movements, we, we don't do the, the hard internal work. Um, and and that's, that's, where, that's where these, these big things fizzle out as moments. When I look at the Occupy, um, the Occupy time was seven years or so ago, uh, it was called a movement, but it was actually a moment. It had some of the pieces of a movement. It had um, it had mass gatherings of people. It had um, intersectional city connections and states involved, and you had protests and you had all of these th these things. But it lacked um, a clear ask. It lacked clear action. Um, and after those moments of marching and protesting fizzled out. Um, it's known as as a thing and not a and not a movement versus uh, the civil rights. Uh, when you when you look at the two in comparison, uh, one had a clear ask 
it had clear action. And once one small thing was accomplished, it took the ceiling off uh, of the entire moment uh, and it catalyzed people into, into this mass movement and which brings us to where we are now. And so, so a part of our work deals with the internal first, like who are you as a human? Uh, how do you interact in the world? How, what's going on in your friend circle? And then you, be, you know, begin to lead yourself first, then you lead the, uh, the layers of the onion that create the whole onion. And so I, I think with this particular moment in time, when I look at many of the, um, the white allies and so on and so forth that are asking, you know, what can they do? How can we jump into this, into this moment in time to create a movement? My first thing before I go into the one, two, three, fours of movement building is always um, doing that, that self moment to movement work inside of you. What is your aha moment? And so I, I think that is the most critical first step is to, uh, to look inside, inside of you. Yeah. And the, there was another kind of piece that you had shared in our conversations that connected to that, um, where you kind of the, there was like a Sears and Roebuck and, uh, <laughs> an earthquake yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1989, the uh, Loma Prieta uh, earthquake. I was an employee at Sears and Roebuck right down on uh, Telegraph slash Broadway. The building sits on both sides. And I worked in the hardware department and the hardware department was in the basement. So I'm in the basement and all of a sudden the building begins to, to shake and tools are falling down from the sky. And as I'm running, uh, through the hardware department, I, uh, I, I find myself kind of encroached in a corner after things leveled off a little bit. Uh, I managed to get upstairs and I remembered something that my grandmother uh, always told me that in case of a natural disaster or some type of state of emergency, there are three things that you do. Uh, the first thing you do is you, uh, you, you mobilize. Like, where, where are you? Let me get my bearings of where I am. Um, and then you, you find out where people are um, in, in black culture. Like, what's the meeting spot? You know, if you get lost, do you meet at grandma's house? Do you meet at, you know, cousin Jim's house? So you, you find out where people are. And, and once you, you find out where folks are, you find out what they need. So it's you mobilize, you find out where people are, and then you find out what they need. And once you find out what they need, then the next word is, is to catalyze, right? Then we know where to start. And I think, I think moments die and never produce into movements is because one, there, you don't know where people are. People are, are splintered all over the place. Um, and once you bring people together, what do they really need? As opposed to creating these systems and these structures and these resolves uh, based on any one organization, their vision, their goals. What do the people need that you're actually serving? Um, and so, so once you find out what that is, then you have a place to start. Uh, but I think the last part to that is the folks that, that have the need have to be involved in the high level conversations. Otherwise you have this small cluster of people that are making these decisions for the mass the, the mass amount of people without knowing what they truly need. So the folks that are in the, the deepest need are most insecure or, or disproportionately affected. They have to be involved um, in the conversation before you can move into, into catalyzing. Yeah. David, can I ask you, um, you know, you've, uh, folks like um, Project Runway, you know, Bali, you know, formerly known as Bali, now Common Future, uh, B Lab, you've, all these like large move, like movement organizations are actually either currently based at Evolve or have been. And I'm curious, what are some of the most successful components that you see? At, you know, you mentioned um, a call, a clear call to action, and a clear ask as like maybe two key things. 
What are some of the other pieces that you've seen some successful movements have? Like what are those components that you've seen um, to be critical to that sustained growth and uh, yeah, enduring, enduring, enduring. Yeah. Yes. I, I would say collaboration. Um, collaboration is critical. Um, you have to remove ego out of this work. Um, you know, we are the best at what we do. We are the leaders. We, 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 um, and not us. Collaboration is the key. Uh, removing ego um, and collaborating to where, hey, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, this chase for the golden nugget. It's. Uh, it reminds me of. Um, it reminds me of um, this thing I went to. I forgot what it was, but but they threw. It was a game where you throw the prize in the middle, and then everybody runs to the middle to see who can be the first at the prize. It re, that's the grant process, right? It's like you throw the grant in the middle, and all of these partners are running to the middle to see who they, you know, who can get the nugget first. What's what's made this work in building out this particular place successful, I believe, is a sharing of the nugget. A, a sense of we are stronger together than we are separate. And, and once we come together, there the playing field is leveled. There, there's ED, CEOs, all those things are left at the door. And we're coming in to try and have a collective strategy and, and thought around how can we be most effective together in meeting the need of this group of people. So when you look at um, Project Runway, when you look at Optima Business Bootcamp, when you look at Food Corps, when you look at Common Future, Health Leads, Emerald Cities, the folks that work out of this space, there are times where, although we're working in different um, industries of work or different sectors of the overall work, there are moments where we come together and we say, what's the one thing that we can, that we can work on together to move the needle of inequity, to move the needle of of racial uh, bias and injustice. And so I think collaboration, leaving the ego at the door um, and a willingness to, um, to actually move something forward. And I think the last piece uh, to that is, is, is action. Like how many meetings have you set in that, that all they talk about is collecting more data? <laughs> it's, it's like, hey, guess what? We know the numbers are staggering. We know that things are disproportionate. Like at what point do we move into action? It's not going to be perfect, but I like to use this model of uh, percentage versus perfection. I'm not looking to be perfect, but I'm looking to have a higher percentage of doing what it takes to move the needle forward. And if I were to just follow that up really quickly, um, and then maybe we could take some some questions coming in. What, uh, so how do you see Black Lives Matter and that success? Like the New York Times said it was, um, it may be the largest movement in US history. Uh, that was like one of their articles. Um, like what, what is that, what is the piece that we can learn from that? Um, and, you know, how does that differ from say, like Occupy or like the movements that fizzled, uh, the moments that fizzled? Yeah, I, I think um, so. There's a there's a more complex uh, answer that I'll steer away from, and then there's a simple answer. Uh, the simple answer is the the name alone is um, is is a a welcoming draw to those with an open heart. Black Lives Matter. Period. Uh, if you poll. I don't know if you poll a hundred people in each of your circles, I, I would, I would venture to say 75% of those will have a different spin on what the movement really is about. Right. Something, you know, some folks think it's about this. Some people think it's about that. Da, 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 da. But, but I think successful movements get everybody talking about something that have to do with the thing. Everyone in the world is talking about Black Lives Matter. Everyone in the world is having some sort of conversation 
around this general theme. And so I think what makes what makes this different uh, from an Occupy is that um, there is a one, there's a clear ask. Um, two, the the inequity is so plain and in your face, no one can deny it. And the third thing is, I believe the conversation is exposing and pushing folks to accountability and or action. I think those are critical things that uh, separate moments uh, from movements. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, like it's, it's calling people to the carpet. You know, it's, it's exposing friend circles. It's, it's exposing, um, you know, people with titles from actually being leaders. It's exposing, you know, disproportionate uh, treatment and in inequities of, of people groups. Like it's exposing so many things. But I think most of all, it's exposing the inner workings of each individual human soul. It's like, oh, I, I'm actually that person. Or, oh, I have friends that use this language. Or, or oh, I have this overwhelming need that I don't want to be that way anymore. And I want to do something uh, about who I am as a person, which will ultimately help how I am with other people. So that, you know, and it's, it's hitting everybody, not just not just folks whose skin hasn't been darkened by nature, sun, but it's hitting it's hitting black folks, too. So, David, I'm going to turn to uh, this question from um, Charlotte in our audience. Uh, she says, how does social media help moments evolve into movements and how does it disable the evolution? Yeah. Great question. Um, so if you look at, I don't know, you take the civil rights movement, right? That was baseline media, a lot of word to mouth, word, uh, a lot of word of mouth that spread um, from network to network. Um, the age of social media has one, exposed good and bad, right? Thank God for a video that could be uploaded uh, with the officer in George Floyd, which has spawned um, a just an open door of all these other videos that are coming in, right? Um, the flip side to it, it's also used to um, to spill out negative propaganda and uh, fake news and false reports. And so, so I think with social media and with all media, you have to find uh, a trusted source. Where, where the truth and the facts live, flow, and are distributed in various communities uh, in different sectors. So I think on one hand, just like anything else, depends on how you use it. Um, it's as wonderful as used in a positive way, and it's as damaging as used um, in a negative way. I mean, that's just my opinion. Yeah, awesome. Um, Andrew, what, what other questions you got for David? And then I can start maybe seeding some uh, audience members who might want to come up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, well, first of all, really appreciate all of the wisdom that you're dropping. It's really, really rich. Um, and I think like one thing we, we have such a diverse movement, right? We have, folks that are, you know, um, like I think one interesting relationship is uh, the relationship say that Lyft economy has with Sustainable Economies Law Center. So the Sustainable Economies Law Center is kind of focus on the policy side of things. And there's also carving out, like changing the conditions that we exist in and the options that are available through policy. Um, and that's also not uh, like that specific work is not Lyft's work. And how are that like that's a microcosm, but how as a you know like thinking about um, you know like say for example movement for Black Lives policy framework, um, how are things like that moving in tandem with our uh, 
you kind of like collectivizing economically and building uh building i think you, you we 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 were excuse me we've referenced the civil war uh a couple of times in the conversation and just thinking about like uh, the role that like land and farms and like kind of movement infrastructure played in that and how that was you know how, how people can you know affect things with investment clubs and and how that's all intersecting so that's a big spaghetti but that's kind of like where my mind is going um you know thinking about all of this right now yeah uh, look spaghetti. at it as um <laughs> yeah look at it look at it as a a um a form of um, an Olympic event, right? If you look at if you look at the relay, um, it's it's designed for for one person to go a distance, to hand off the baton to another to go a distance. But all folks on that team have their eye on the finish line. They know where it is. The person that starts is not designed to get to that line, but, but, but that individual is designed to, to run their portion, hand it off to the next to run their portion. Um, that, that's how I see, that's how I see this work um, of movement building and, and the sustainability of a movement, right? So if, if I start the race and, and I know my job is to run that sprint, that's how I train, that's how I work out. Uh, I partner around people that, that have experience in getting to that sprint. But, but the minute I shift focus that I want to, I want to be the one that gets to the end, then I circumvent the whole race. And, and so, so in this, I believe it's so effective when people simply do their part and be okay with handing the baton to the next knowing that we're all working for the same goal and that's to get to the finish line and that that's in, and i'm a i'm a sports guy so i may use a hundred sports analogies in anything that i talk about but but for me it's 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 how do we all focus on what that end game is and then we do our part to to run this race to get there because if if andrew you cross the line i win even if i started if it's my job to cross the line Ryan, you win, even if you were handing off the baton in the middle. Yeah, love your analogies. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Ryan, did we have anyone that I just, I've been focused on the chat? I was. Um, um uh, yeah, I'm gonna see if uh, maybe Dan. Danny come up or uh, Isabel or Charlotte. So if any of even if the three of you want to come up, love to get some we get energized by audience members, uh, yeah. co-creators coming up on stage. So maybe um, if I were to uh, throw you another question, David, while we're getting somebody else up, um, you know, we we talked about movement building you know before we had this crowdcast we talked about um this idea of uh is there something that's stitching together these different movements you know like is there a is there a place where people can go that can like where different movements connect into like a movement of movements and you were kind of saying yeah i think there's it's not really defined up there it seems like there's a lot of movements but there may be working in isolation or they're not really communicating with each other. And so what do you see as, what are some of that, those like foundational pieces to make that connect better or to sort of um, like what's needed to bring say, uh, you know, climate change group and like, you know, the sort of um, the racial justice and maybe like labor unions, like how are we, bringing those folks together more or like what's that what's that connective tissue we're missing yeah it's um there's a lot of i, I use the word a lot splintering 
um, in this particular movement. I think there are a lot of uh, subsets around the country, but there, there, there doesn't seem to be a trusted, um, a trusted center where information, where access, where resource um, actually flows through, and and folks, folks at a high level are talking to each other, but folks in the mid level aren't communicating with the high level, they don't have access to those rooms. And so, so I believe that, um, that there is something forming. Um, if not, Evolve will attempt to, to, to create that. But, um, but what I do know is happening is there are a lot of conversations, a lot of conversations happening, a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, information that's flowing, but now it's disseminating that information and kind of figuring out what's the, the, the hole that it plugs into. So, so I think that would be a, a key, a key thing to have in any movement, but especially this one, because trust is a major, a major piece to why folks don't, co you know, connect, uh, from the lowest level to the highest level. So uh, I believe it's needed not happening right now, but um, I think that would be a key component. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Isabel. Hi. Welcome, Isabel. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Great to have you back. Again. See you again. <laughs> I can't get rid of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, we love it. So Actually, what's on your mind, Isabel? What's coming up for you? Um, any questions, thoughts, or? Yeah, so since last time, uh, let's see. I've kicked off the community in San Diego. Basically, literally everything that David said just um, resonates with me of like reaching out to the people, what do the people actually need, involving them in the decision-making process and building solutions for them. Totally stepping back on the ego of just like, sure, I have a grand vision and that would be great, but it's maybe may or may not be relevant to what people need. And so I'm totally open, just, you know, being super flexible. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, what's, how to say this, um, similarities between, you know, the movement of movements and, and bringing people together and also the startup community and startup principles, like a lean startup and things like that. Um, so the funny thing is, I think I've been trying to pick up and, and constantly putting down and picking it back up again, this book um, called Startup Communities by Brad Fell. Um, if you don't know who Brad Feld is, which I didn't know, he's one of the co-founders of Techstars, pretty famous um, global accelerator program all about mentorship. And they kind of flipped the model on how investors and founders relationship is. Um, anyway, so Techstars started out of Boulder, Colorado. And um, I guess it's like, it's just like a weird hot spot for a startup community and they're trying to like dig into that and why it's that he'd been living there for some time. But um, the funny thing is I was reading an article um, this came up about a theory for social entrepreneurs and they were talking about his theory and I'll post it in the chat. But I mean, I can literally just read it and it's exactly what David just said. Um, four principles of why Boulder is so great and what everyone else needs to do to kind of mimic it. Um, entrepreneurs must lead the startup community. So I guess for us, it's like people who are in this movement need to be leading the community, right? So feeders versus leaders. So you want leaders leading the community and not feeders. So, pe so people like me, I'm a feeder. I love what you guys are doing. I'm not a leader. I should not be leading this community. Um, two, the leaders must have a long-term commitment. And by long-term, he means 20 years in the same geography. If you don't have a plan for staying there for 20 years, you need to have a plan to hand it off to someone who will. And that 20 years starts over every day. It's 20 years from today, 20 years from tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you've been there 10 years or anything like that. Um, number three, the community must be inclusive of anyone who wants to participate in it. So it's not just entrepreneurs, it's not just leaders. Anyone who has an interest in this um, should be included. And number four, and the community must have continued activities that engage the entire entrepreneurial stack. So not just having you know events where we talk about things and we say how great we've been doing and what we're working on, 
the things where you actually get to communicate and discuss with other people and hear what you know what they're trying to do what they're interested in um, so having even just like coffee meetups or something like that is one of his examples so i feel like this is literally everything that you know we've been talking about for the past half hour kind of interesting totally yeah thanks for sharing that as well yeah um yeah i don't know does that bring up anything for either of you do you want to respond to that at all Um. I mean, I think, David, one of the other questions that sort of is, a, is similar to this um, and maybe is like where Isabel is sort of pointing towards um, is like, how do you define or describe, this is like one of the questions that came up from Kevin, how do you define or describe the finish line or the in or the end game? Like, what are we running towards? Um, how do you think about that piece, David, when you're talking about movement building? It, it for me, it surfaces out of um, the need. The need is, for me, an easy descriptor of what the end is. Um, the need is where we start, and it helps to guide us to the end. Uh, whether it's liberation, whether it's um, whether it's it, we could take something like equal pay uh, for women in corporate America, like the, the 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 clear the clear ask, the clear need, I believe, paints a clear picture of what of what the end is. Right in a, in a race, it's a it's a bit different than in this context. In this context, the end may move a bit. It may inch out a bit as you get closer to it. Needs evolve, you know, they develop, and so it inches out a bit more. Um, but I believe knowing what the need is brings into full view and focus on on where you're headed, the tools and the resources that you need to get to to that end, um, and then it develops and evolves in a in a natural uh, progression. I, I think we're we're not. We're not inviting the voices uh, of the people that are most vulnerable. Where we we're throwing around these words like equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we're making them simply about metrics. Uh, but the but the folks that we are serving, their voices are still not being heard to inform uh, what that line is. Right. And so, as as Isabel said, like we're we we're infusing. It's almost like we're force feeding our vision upon people to accept it as their truth. Like if if <laughs> you can't make me eat peanuts if I'm allergic to them, guess what? They may be your favorite. I can't eat them. Find out what I like. And then when you go to the store, you will shop based on what my needs are. You will, you will buy, you will resource based on what my needs are and not based on what you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's almost like um, this is a, a social problem, like foundationally a problem with our society. Like diversity and inclusion, I feel like is oftentimes treated as like transactional. Um, and not so much of like a transformation process, which is more like, it's not, it's not about how do we hire more black and Latin people, right? It's about how, do, how does that no longer become a question, right? Yeah, that, that right there, what you said is it, right? It's, um, okay, can I, do I have a quick second to give you guys a story? There's a story about a, a dog named Fred. Fred was good at, at biting people. Everywhere Fred went, Fred would bite somebody. You take Fred to the store, Fred bit someone. You know, Finally, um, the owner said, hey, I'm going to keep Fred in the fence uh, to keep Fred from, from biting people. And the package delivery person went into, into the yard thinking that Fred was chained up. Fred you know, ran and, and bit the package delivery driver. So. Um, the owner had to go to court and uh, brought Fred to court with a muzzle. So, so in court, 
uh, the owner was trying to show, you know, that that Fred is different now uh, because Fred had a muzzle. And so Fred would, you know, kind of do 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 its thing. But um, so finally, uh, Fred went back home and uh, the, the minute they took the muzzle off Fred, uh, Fred started biting people again. And, and so what I discovered from that analogy is that um, with the muzzle on, Fred had behavioral modification, but lacked inner transformation. On the outside, because the muzzle was on, Fred wouldn't bite people. But on the inside, Fred was still mean, nasty, ugly, angry, wanted to bite people all the time. And I think what's happening now is that you have a lot of folks that are uh, changing their social media, that are you know, sending out lots of money for behavioral modification, but there's no inner transformation. People aren't taking the time to do the, the inner work, which is what is the passion that pushes the real work up and down the hill. And so I think to your point, when we get to a place in our society where there's true inner transformation, you know, this whole piece that, uh, yeah, I do see color, but what I see doesn't make me greater or lesser, but we're, we're all kind of coming together as this. I think we'll see more systemic change, but until there's, there's true inner transformation, then a lot of this work is, is going around, uh, going around in circles. The preacher, so he may have thought that was our face. <laughs> a good one. <laughs> um, let me, uh, Isabel, I'm going to try and bring up some other folks. If I could uh, rotate you, is that cool? Okay, cool. Um, so let's see, I was going to get. Um, Someone else up, and then David. This is simple, simple question for you. But what are you? What are you most excited about right now? Out of everything you're seeing, what piece is getting you most juiced in the morning? Every every morning, there is someone else having a conversation, like. That's charging me. Um, that that folks are are still talking about it. You know that that there's there's some real momentum around uh, around systemic structural uh, change. So that that's exciting to me. Kevin. We brought you up because you have a um, deep, insightful question. What's your question to David? <clears throat> Put me on the spot. Uh, well, I'm I'm curious for. I mean, I always I always vibe on when David has a chance to share what he's been watching and looking at. And earlier, you mentioned David that collaboration and breaking down these siloed efforts is one of the key things when we're handing off the baton, knowing the intersection points. And one question that I get really curious about is, do we have all the right pieces in place, but they're just not collaborating or, or are there gaps? And maybe it's, maybe we don't know, but like what gaps are you potentially seeing that are out there that uh, we really haven't, there's, there's not enough yet maybe, and not enough effort or we need to see more. What do you see as some of the gaps? Maybe it's in, Maybe it's in the funding or maybe, I mean, I don't know where it is. I'm just curious what you see as the gaps out there. Yeah, I, I would, one of the gaps I see is, is a clear, a clear directional ask. Like, are we mobilizing around um, defunding? Are we mobilizing around, you know, is it, is it the wealth gap? Uh, because there are so many disproportionate things 
uh, it's difficult to choose one, but it would be good to list in priority so that there's there's some type of um, clear picture around is the needle moving? Um, do you know what type of resourcing do we need? But I think that clear that clear ask is what continues to um, to to come up in circles that I'm in. Hmm. Yeah, and and who's asking? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. is 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 the NAACP the the spokespersons for all things black? Is it color of change? Is it you know who who is the trusted right in the in the uh, in the '60s? It was Martin Luther King. Um, it wasn't a particular organization, but it was a leader. Um, so, like, what what's the trusted? Um, who is the trusted entity? You know, I'm not saying you need a leader, but I think when they're splintering, you have to bring it into um, into some sort of uh, focus because the masses of people don't understand this jargon that we speak in the language. Um, but what they do understand is we are in a dogfight and we're fighting for X. Um, and I think that will inform how people vote. It will inform um, how people move uh, through this, this current movement that we're in. I, I see a lot of that too. And thanks for naming that. Yeah, I think one of the gaps is like the clear ask. I don't know if you, I'm curious if you all see it similar but like I see, um, I was talking to on on the podcast that uh, Andrea has published recently through Next Economy. Now I was talking to Makani Temba, and and she was saying, you know, we both need the urgent action now, where the priority in a lot of cases is like life. Like, hey, we're under attack. You know, the black community is under attack. Black and brown community is under attack. We need to survive. And that could be, you could take that from police to COVID. There's lots of things that are disproportionately, literally threatening the life, the, the ability to survive of our black and brown communities. And then, so you got, there's an urgency to start there. And then there's like the, the long game, the collective liberation, the King vision, you know, get around, how do we get to a beautiful community? How do we, how do we get there? Um, and there's like a bridging in between. And then somewhere in the middle, I'm seeing like, like I love the work of Movement for Black Lives, their policy platforms. Um, now that's policy, I know, but like when you read their policy platforms, there's a lot of detail there in the middle. These are places where maybe baton handoffs are happening, where if all those, if we were able to click the box on every one of the M4BL policy platform things, it's 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 definitely a different world. I don't know if it's all the way to collective liberation yet, if we're bridged all the way there, um, but it's also not as simple as um, the urgent message of today, right? Like it's like lives are at, at risk, right? And so there's somewhere in the middle, and I think it is a lot to hold, right? Like uh, I think some people are holding the collective liberation vision, some people are definitely importantly I, th I think we all need to focus right now on saving lives because there's a direct threat and then there's this middle which uh i, I just named the m4bl stuff just because it's awesome but there's there's probably other things too i'm wondering if you see any of those similar dynamics or if you see it differently or what am i you know what's what are some of my blind spots there yeah i i think you're i think you're hitting it spot on um I think one one thing to add is we are we're missing a key component, and that's the community level. I believe that things have uh, taken flight from an organizational level, from a corporate level, government level, which brings us to policy, but um, but but that deep community level. I believe is is uh, is is missing, and that goes back to um, it goes. It's it's a it's a two edged sword, right? It's not informing the people, and then it's not hearing their voice. So if if you're not informing them and you're not hearing their voice, how can you serve them? And so I, I think that's a uh, that's a big. I still believe is a is a big missing piece. Is uh, how do we engage 
um, our our community activists? How do we um, how do we engage um, the folks that they serve into into this fight? Yeah, and, and you're right though. Like, I'm sorry, Andrew. I, this piece that um, this this big piece that's not really centered the way I believe it should be is um, th the fight for one's physical life. Like that is a real thing, y'all. It's a real thing for for me, a, a 40 plus year old black man uh, who is the CEO of a pretty decent company, uh, who is a leader in the community, a family guy, it's a real thing that I could get in my car and drive a thousand feet from my house, be pulled over and lose my life. Like that, there's an anxiety that exists when, uh, when the highway patrol pulls behind me and I have license, registration, proof of insurance, no warrants, you know, all of the check boxes and my heart begins to race. So, so there is there is a real fight for the life, the physical life of of black folks, and then when you slowly begin to move past that, there there's a fight for your own mental health. Before we before we get to liberation conversations and freedom conversations and and closing the wealth gap and equity and before we get to that, like there's a there's a real thing that you may not make it to the next week if your skin is the color of mine. You know, and so so I so I, I think I think having that's what that's what folks in our baseline communities are dealing with every day. Every day. And if we're not centering those stories, if we're not centering um, that content, then I, I, I think much of the mark we will continue to miss. Thank you, Dave, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to kick Kevin off briefly, so get Daniela up. But you want to ask another question? Yeah. Well, I was just going to. Uh, I've been trying to kind of step back and, and and just be in a listening space in this conversation. But um, yeah, I just want to echo what you shared. David really resonates. Um, if we're not listening to the voices and we're not serving them, I think this is a huge intention of how we're trying to hold this space in this conversation. And we're kind of like, um, I'm seeing this, like, there's like all of these levels that kind of need to be integrated and coordinated, right? Like we need to be within ourselves, like at the personal level, engaging in a certain type of way um that's in you know regenerative relation re, like healthy loving relationship and um you know we need to be so we need to be in conversation with ourselves and then you know with those around us in community and organizations and, and then like the movement conversation i think like that tier is like um is I think the part that feels a little bit um, enigmatic on how to best, like we're talking about surfacing the needs, like what's needed and how can we best like surface that and aggregate that and see trends and, and kind of have that conversation and that awareness at that level. That's, what, that's like kind of um, where my mind keeps going. Cause they're like, we have the we have the emergent needs that come as things continue to unfold, um, uh, you know, and the complexity that surrounds us, and also we have these like entrenched, you know, situations where we need to, um, you know, build, uh, have assets and build economic power in order to have the resilience <coughs> to do some of that stuff to be to find ourselves in a safe place. Um, so that we can build from that place. Um, 
So I just wanted to share that reflection, but welcome, Danny. <laughs> hey, Danny. <laughs> hey. Danny How was at Pros Prospera, David, and um, also on our MBA course. Danny, any uh, questions? Uh, you had a great comment, but yeah, what's coming up for you? Any questions for David or thoughts you want to share? Yeah, I mean, since this series started, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I remember the first one um, when Kevin was like, this keeps me up at night. How do we join forces and move forward? Um, and that kept me that night awake, <laughs> thinking about all this. And when I, when I what I said there is that what, what, what David was saying, like, uh, what is the real goal for everyone? And I think that when I think about that, what comes into my mind is this current economic system that uh, encourages to to individualism and to keep us apart. Because of course, if we're all together, we're all suffering from the same, I mean, in different ways, but uh, it, it, it touches, um, it touches us in different in different ways, but uh, it's, uh, it's, I think that the, the main thing is that this economic system um, doesn't care about us and has a government that works for the wealthy and not for the people. And 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 we're all left uh, yeah, it, like out of the of the equation, right? And we're just uh, labor power, that's it. And but if we but but divided because they need us divided and and they encourage they encourage racism and they encourage sexism and they encourage because if we all join this is this will be uncontrollable for them right because they need us they need they need us to, in order to to be profitable to have all this profit right and to keep the system going so there's i think we are I, the same as david if what um, gives me hope every day that I see more awakening, more awareness uh, of, of what's of what's going on, and I think that uh, we start rethinking things and see we, there's a lot of our learning that we need to do, and we need to we need to trust our roots and and how things were um, done, including everyone and the environment, in order to um, to create wealth for everyone. So when I see, when I see the, this so-called leaders, um, like here in the United States or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Piñera in my country in Chile, um, saying, and I mean, so being so disrespectful with people, with their people that chose them or not, um, but um, where they're supposed to work for, right? And I see, yeah, they need us to be separated. They need us to create, you know, frictions in between us. And that's, if we go further, that's not true. We are all together in this and we are suffering from, from what this economic system is doing to us, to our lives, to, to not letting us communicate. And I think that, Unfortunately, a pandemic like this had to happen to uh, you know to all need to communicate that we, we feel the, the need of communicating and say, yes, I think the same. Yes, yes, I suffer from the same thing. Yes, I want to you know do something. And I need, as David said also, I need action. That's what I, what, what I'm aiming for, action. And, and I, don't, I don't need more yesterday. So I, I think we all know what's going on. Um, but it's hard. Changes are always hard, but uh, they're they're needed. They're good. I don't know. Thank you, Danny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, do you have yeah. any reflections on that? And then maybe we're almost at time. And I'm wondering, David, if you also have, if you want to fold in any uh, requests or like, you know, next steps or yeah, like anything you would want the audience to take away. Um, in addition to any reflections you had on Danny. Yeah, I wanted to thank Danny for 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 those powerful 
words. Honored. Um, like, like if if I could take just one snippet away from that, it is the the fact that historically nothing has been given to us, but only yes. taken. So, so what do you do? What do you do in a system that is designed to only take? You step out of that system and you begin to mobilize your folks and you create, you find your own resources. You begin to support your own folks. You begin to build new systems while you're dismantling another, right? If we just dismantle the system without simultaneously building a new system that works for all, then we'll be even further behind. So how do we start now in supporting one another? How do we start now in uh, sharing resources uh, with one another? Because I'm a firm believer that we are all we need. We, you and me, me and you, you and you, we are all we need. And, and so with that, um, if, I, if I had one thought to leave with everyone that I think is a tangible something that we could take away, that would be um, to use your voice. Like you may not have the answers, you may not have the resources, whatever it is that you think you don't have, what you do have is your voice because your voice is your, uh, is your contribution. Like your voice is your contribution to yourself, to your family, to your intimate circle of friends, to your network, to your colleagues, your voice is your contribution. And, and for people of color, your voice is not only your contribution, but it can ultimately lead to your compensation. Right. Do not let folks undervalue your voice. All the free labor, all the free talks. No, like, hey, guess what? You got to pay me for it. Your voice is your contribution. So use your voice uh, and allow your voice to ring and reverberate in your circles. But the first place that your voice has to shake is inside of you. Uh, so that that's that's what I would want to leave with everyone to, to use your voice. Can I, can I say something? So powerful, thank you. And I, you know, I just, I was interviewed by a, a 14 year old from the Ohio University, which is taking a, a summer, um, a summer course. And she, um, she was interested in cooperatives. There are like many people that were um, available for being interviewed for different things. And I was in cooperatives. Um, and and what you said is just what I told. She said, uh, "Give me like a what? What will you tell like the new the next or the new generations, right? Um, in order to like an advice, right? And I tell just don't let anyone tell you what you are capable or not capable to do. Just I think that that's the main thing. You follow your dreams. You have you have you can do whatever you think you can do." You can be the best your the best self, the best yourself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only can you be, but you are. You are. Like right? <laughs> you are. Yeah, you you are. Every right. day you are you are a living example of resilience, of power, of prosperity, of wealth, of peace, of joy. You are that every day. And no one can take that away from you. Not a soul. You yes. are that. Right now. Yep. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, that's a powerful note to end on. And yeah, I just want to, in that, you know, we're all, you know, I think in this circle, in the spirit of lift as we climb and, in, you know, just invoking like, there's also so much greatness to, to look back to that, you know, that have gotten us to this moment. And I, you know, I think it's like, the, the Haitian Re Revolution and Harriet Tubman, and it's like we can focus on on strategic areas to help get us all home, get us all to that safe place. So thank you, everyone, for joining this conversation. We're going to continue to uh, hold these. Our next one is coming up. Um, what is it? Uh, the sorry. <laughs> well, uh, July twenty eighth. Thank you, thank you. But in any case, um, uh, yeah. Next one will be July 28th. And um, yeah, just thank you so much, uh, David, 
really appreciate and honored to have you join us today and share some of your wisdom. And Donnie, thank you for joining us. Isabel, shout, shouting you out. And uh, thanks everyone for engaging with the chat. I really appreciate this building ongoing conversation. We'll keep it going. Thank you for ha for bringing in this space. And thank you, David. Honored. Thank you, everyone. No, honor's mine. Thank you so much. And thank you all. Love, you know, one? my love Thanks. to lift economy. <laughs> <laughs> See you all on the 28th, hopefully. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.